program, I'd like to welcome all of you here this morning, where we are pleased uh, to host the Energy Information Administration's rollout of their International Energy Outlook 2011. And for any of you who are like us, who um, borrow liberally or rely on uh, heavily the International Energy Outlook and all of the other EIA products, whether it's data collection or data analysis or outlooks, um, for our own work and for some of the insights uh, that we bring to our work, um, you will understand that we're very pleased to have such an important document um, be released here so that we can have a good discussion on some of the new trends and analysis uh, that EIA has brought to the fore looking ahead over the next several decades. Um, you'll also recognize how when it got to be around that time of year when we were expecting the IEO to come out and it didn't, and rumors started flying that the IEO wasn't going to be out, we really got concerned. We started to ask questions about what on earth we would do without such an important document to rely on for our work. And so we're very, very pleased and relieved um, to have the document here uh, today and to have EIA release it um, and to be able to talk about it uh, and use it for our work in the coming year. So uh, we are also very happy to have uh, Howard Grunspecht, who is not a uh, uh, a stranger to any of you, whether you work in the government or think tank land, he's a veteran of both. Um, he is here today as acting administrator and also deputy administrator, so he's dual-headed, uh, of the Energy Information Administration. And he'll do a presentation of the, uh, the IEO trends, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion afterwards. So thanks for being here. Well, thank you. And hold that thought about the uh, IEO in the future. <laughs> <laughs> It's great to be here at CSIS. Thank you, Sarah, for the kind introduction. And thanks to you and Guy and Frank Verastro and everyone else I know here for hosting us today. Uh, this is the sixth year, I believe, that the Energy Information has released our International Energy Outlook at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And we certainly appreciate the opportunity to share our views with such a knowledgeable uh, audience. It makes the Q&A more fun, too, to have a knowledgeable audience. Uh, this is our latest assessment of, of world uh, energy markets. Uh, it includes projections that go to 2035. Uh, unlike many other long-term outlooks, which usually incorporate at least the expected value of policy changes that can significantly influence energy outcomes, uh, the IEO is based on existing uh, laws and, and policies and regulations, uh, and as is the case with all data and analyses from the EIA, the views presented in the IEO are ours alone and do not represent, necessarily represent those of the Department of Energy or the administration. Uh, I should also say that we underestimated the interest in this and we don't have enough handouts, but the good news is like all EIA stuff, uh, the handouts, the press release, the full report itself, I believe, are posted on the EIA website as of today. So, and no charge. Uh, so, uh, while I'm the sort of the spokes model for presenting the outlook, although I don't look much like Vanna White, uh, the credit for developing it really belongs to uh, EIA's Office of uh, Energy Analysis, which is directed by John Conti, who unfortunately can't be here today. Uh, many staff members are involved. Uh, I would single out uh, Ms. Linda Doman, who I think is supposed to be here today, but I don't see her. Uh, and, the, and I guess a whole uh, team of people from the IEO. Uh, uh, but Linda plays a leading role in pulling the outlook together that deserves a special mention. Uh, I must also note, uh, picking up on, on Sarah's lead, that the pleasure of the EIA staff in bringing this outlook to completion is somewhat dampened by resource constraints that are uh, really uh, precluding us from pursuing work on next year's edition. Uh, so given the growing importance of developments in, in global energy markets for our domestic energy future, we certainly look forward to uh, bringing, uh, continuing to bring you the IEO to inform policymakers and the public about critical linkages but I think that's uh, you know, a little bit of a question mark in the present uh, resource environment. So with that, uh, I'll take the punchlines first. Uh, you know, we do see substantial growth uh, in world energy consumption. Uh, about 
half of the 53% uh, increase in world energy use we see comes from China and India alone. Uh, renewables are the fastest growing uh, form of energy use, uh, and liquid fuels are the slowest growing form. But again, it, you, one needs to recognize that the bases are very different, and liquids remain the largest share of energy consumed worldwide, and, and at least through 2035 in these projections, and the oil share of world energy use is 28 percent in 2035 compared to a renewable share of roughly 15 percent. Uh, fossil fuels as a whole uh, continue to dominate uh, world uh, energy use. Uh, again, their share falls from sort of about 85 percent today to a little bit under 80 percent uh, in 2035. Uh, we do see, uh, you know, a strong outlook for natural gas, in particular the outlook for unconventional uh, natural gas, although one has to be careful about the terms conventional and unconventional when resources that we characterize as unconventional now constitute a huge proportion of uh, domestic uh, natural gas production. But we do see uh, world natural gas markets being well supplied and, and prices uh, being attractive relative to other fuels, and our projected natural gas use in 2035 is 8 percent higher than in last year's outlook. Uh, we do see uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, continuing uh, to rise. That, that reflects the rise in uh, fossil uh, energy use. Uh, as you know, uh, EIA always emphasizes how uncertain any long-run projections are, but I think many developments over the past year make the uh, energy outlook even more uncertain than usual. A recovery from the recent financial crisis and economic downturn uh, has been very uneven. Actual and projected recovery, particularly in the developed economies, is currently much more sluggish than expectations at the time the uh, last edition of the outlook was put together. Uh, this is certainly not the time or place for a discussion, extended discussion of economic prospects, but many prominent analysts are pointing to the distinction between financial crises and typical recessions with the former having far longer lasting impact on economic and employment growth. Uh, and so far, you know, we, we might be getting into that situation, and that certainly has implications uh, for the energy picture. Uh, you know, economic growth continues to look good in emerging nations. We have the disaster at Japan's Fukushima Daiichi uh, reactor, and that certainly uh, is likely, I think, to have very adverse or somewhat, at least somewhat adverse long-term implications for nuclear power's role in the global energy mix, depending on the responses of policymakers and industry. I should point out that the IEO projections were, for nuclear, were developed prior to the Fukushima disaster and therefore may overstate nuclear power's future role. Uh, you know, we have a tight uh, supply-demand balance in oil markets, and that means that even modest actual or anticipated changes uh, in supplier demand conditions can lead to large movements in oil prices, and we've seen that already this year. And again, the uh, natural gas uh, prospects, while they're good news, it's still uh, early days and there are significant uncertainties uh, regarding both the resource estimates uh, and the underlying economics and some of the concerns that people may have with the environmental uh, implications, and so we don't really know where production levels are going to be. So with those special caveats, I'd like to delve deeper into the uh, outlook. Uh, and again, we do we don't build in any policy changes. Uh, we generally reflect known technology and known demographic and, and technological trends. Of course, the real surprise would be if important policy shifts, uh, technology breakthroughs, and market surprises did not occur over the next 25 years. So the reference case is really intended to present a jumping off point. Uh, for considering the impact of such changes. It's not that we don't believe such changes will occur. They will occur. We just don't know uh, what they are. So with that, uh, this is the big picture. Again, we've shown uh, world energy use uh, rising significantly. Of course, uh, nearly all of the growth occurs in countries 
outside the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, and their demand is driven by long-term economic growth. Uh, you know, in, in currently, I guess uh, 2008 is our last uh, data year when we put this together. The non-OECD accounted for a bit more than half of total world energy use. By 2035, uh, the projected share rises to nearly two-thirds. So now I'd like to turn a little bit to where the energy is used, the key demand drivers, and what types of energy are used. So this is, is meant to highlight the key role of Asian developing economies in particular in world energy markets. Uh, so the first uh, bar, bar the, I guess the two green bars are the OECD together, and the first one is the non-OECD Asia, which is dominated by, by India and China. Uh, and again, you can see that, uh, you know, even since 1990 to 2008, which is the history part of this presentation, there's been a tremendous uh, growth in the, in the share of non-OECD Asia in energy. Uh, the share, uh, China and India alone combined for about 21 percent of total world energy consumption in, uh, in 2008. Uh, in our projection by 2035, those two countries uh, account for 31 percent of world energy consumption. In fact, as shown in the last set of bars, uh, non-OECD Asia's energy use in 2035 is to projected to exceed the energy use of all OECD countries combined. So just part of the non-developing world in Asia will exceed the entire, what we have called the developed world. Uh, in 2035, China's energy demand is 68 percent higher than U.S. energy demand. Uh, and again, uh, China's near-term economic growth uh, has been revised upwards, actually, since last year's outlook. And China's GDP on a purchasing power parity basis surpasses that of the United States in 2019. That's a couple of years earlier than in last year's uh, outlook. And again, as I've already noted, uh, debt levels in many advanced developing nations could have a profound impact on midterm prospects for economic growth. Uh, I guess that's mostly a developed country problem, the financial crisis, but questions remain as to whether China, India, and the rest of the developed world can continue high economic growth rates and for how long if there's weak demand for their exports. So, you know, I think it's, uh, those of you familiar with the Kaya identity, this is sort of a clipped form of the, of the Kaya identity. I think it's useful to think of energy use as a product of three factors, uh, energy use per unit of economic output, uh, economic output per capita, and population. And obviously growth in economic activity per person and population uh, tend to drive increases in energy use, while uh, reduction in energy use per unit of economic output which results from both efficiency improvements and structural changes works in the opposite direction. And really for all three of the drivers, uh, per capita income, population, and energy intensity, there are significant differences across countries and regions as seen in this chart. And the greatest differences are in the areas of projected economic performance, which are the, the brown bars. Uh, per capita, Economic output in the U.S. and OECD Europe are projected to grow at an average annual rate of about 1.6 percent per year over the projection period, and that's less than one-third uh, China's projected growth rate in per capita income, which exceeds 5 percent. China's growing even more rapidly than that right now, but we expect that to, uh, to slow down over time but the average is still more than three times uh, the U.S. and OECD Europe uh, projected growth. There are also significant differences in projected population growth, and I think sometimes these are not really paid enough attention to. Uh, projected population growth rates are not that closely tied to the level of economic development. For example, both China and OECD Europe 
have significantly lower expected population growth rates than the U.S. and India. Uh, and again, there's a lot of detail there, but the growth rates are the green bars, population growth. Uh, moving to other areas, population grows fastest in the Middle East and Africa and is actually expected to decline in both Russia and Japan. So there's quite a big disparity in, in population, projected population growth rates, and these are the UN-based. And again, it's not just an issue of developed versus developing. There's quite a mix. Uh, finally, turning to the blue bars, which are projected rates of improvement in energy intensity, uh, they also vary across key countries and regions, but the differences are generally much smaller than those in per capita income. Uh, China has the highest rate of uh, projected energy intensity improvement, uh, but its impact on the level of energy use is swamped by the ex extremely rapid growth in per capita uh, income. Uh, the U.S. also has a higher rate of energy intensity improvement than most other regions, but that reflects in part the higher starting level of energy intensity within the U.S. Uh, economy. So, turning from the drivers of energy consumption to what energy sources are used over time, I've already touched on this. Uh, the use of all fuels grows. Uh, fossil fuels uh, dominate uh, the world's energy mix throughout the projection. Uh, again, although renewable energy is the world's fastest growing uh, form of energy, uh, oil remains the largest source of energy, but its share falls from 34% in 2008 to 28% in 2035. You notice there's 29% here because that includes liquid biofuels, which do grow uh, a little bit. Uh, again, I've mentioned the uh, strong growth in natural gas use. Uh, I should point out that coal, natural gas, and renewables all compete as fuels for electric power generation, and the actual mix of fuels chosen to meet electricity needs can be very sensitive to policy actions. So we don't build in the policy actions but we certainly recognize that that's a sector in which there's a particular uh, sensitivity. So like, like everybody else, uh, EIA is paying uh, considerable attention to world oil markets, and the, the tight supply-demand balance means that even modest changes in, in actual or anticipated supply or demand conditions can lead to large movements uh, in prices. Uh, we've certainly seen significant market responses to both the disruption in supply from Libya this year and changes in the economic outlook. Uh, I want to point out that it's a short-run energy outlook that's updated each month that presents a forecast of energy markets over the next 12 to 24 months along with quantitative measures of price uncertainty based on the market value of energy futures and options contracts. And it's that outlook, rather than the IEO that uh, we're discussing today, is where analysts, policymakers, and the public can find EIA's perspective on current and near-term oil market conditions. So with that, let's hop into it. Uh, we do see oil prices in real terms continuing to rise. Uh, as the world economy recovers, global demand grows, and supply increases face both below ground and above ground challenges. Uh, in 2035, the average real price of crude oil in the reference case rises to about $125 per barrel in 2009 dollars, or about $200 per barrel in nominal dollars. Again, this, this builds on an assumption that OPEC uh, seeks to maintain a fairly constant share of world liquids production and that access limitations in resource-rich countries outside of OPEC continue to restrain uh, the growth in their conventional liquids production. Uh, but I should point out that in addition to the reference case, the IEO includes high and low uh, oil price cases that span a wide range. In prior editions of the Outlook, these cases were motivated exclusively by shifts in supply conditions. 
However, it's clear to us that demand surprises that are tied to economic growth prospects can also be the sources of major shifts in oil market conditions. Indeed, economic growth in the developing world plays a critical role for two reasons. First, developing countries are moving through levels of per capita income at which energy demand is particularly responsive to income changes. In other words, you know, using the technical jargon, uh, these countries have a higher income elasticity of energy and oil demand than developed countries or the world as a whole. And so that higher sensitivity coupled with more absolute uncertainty in the growth projections in developing countries reflecting both their higher baseline uh, expectations for growth and perhaps less firmly established uh, market regimes. So in the new outlook, demand as well as supply uncertainties are reflected in our oil price uh, cases. So here's sort of the, the big picture on uh, petroleum and other liquids. Uh, and we include biofuels in this. I'm not sure the IEA does, although they, I think they report separately on biofuels in their numbers. But we see the uh, use of liquid fuels uh, in the reference case growing uh, dramatically. It reaches uh, 112 million barrels per day in, in 2035. Uh, again, most of the growth in liquid fuels is in transport. We're in the absence of... Uh, significant advances, liquids continue to provide much uh, lion's share of the energy consumed. I should point out that these projections don't reflect, again, pending policies, such as the fuel economy standards for model years, you know, 2017 through 2025, that are expected to be proposed this fall in the United States and promulgated next year. I mean, those would have an impact both in the U.S. and presumably in other countries as well as some of the technologies and approaches and vehicle types to meet those standards if they were enacted, kind of spilled over into the rest of the world. So uh, we have, uh, you know, an increasing volumes of conventional liquids, but conventional liquids is more than just crude oil. It's crude oil, lease condensate, natural gas plant liquids, and refinery gain. Uh, you know, we have about a 17 million barrel per day increase in conventional liquids, but the increased supply of natural gas plant liquids accounts for over one-third of that total increase in conventional supplies, and the growth in crude oil and condensate is about 11.5 uh, million barrels per day. Uh, reference case oil prices are sustained at levels that are high relative to all but the most recent historical experience, and this allows unconventional resources, a category for us that includes oil, sands or tar sands, take your choice, we're agnostic, uh, I know our Canadian friends here are less agnostic, uh, extra heavy oil, biofuels, coal to liquids, gas to liquids, and shale oil, uh, sorry, it's not, it should be oil shale, sorry, oil shale is unconventional, for us shale oil is conventional, which is actually quite important. Uh, from both OPEC and non-OPEC suppliers. So the unconventionals at the top of this bar clearly uh, become competitive, particularly when geopolitical or other above-ground constraints limit access to prospective conventional sources. So unconventional plays a pretty big role uh, in this uh, outlook. In our reference case, the Middle East which has large amounts of high quality resources, is the primary source of increases in conventional uh, OPEC production. Uh, as shown in this slide, we're penciling in Saudi Arabia and Iraq as the primary sources of increased OPEC supplies, although not at levels, I think, that, you know, if you go back 10 years and look at some of the stuff that uh, was being projected, I think Saudi levels were much, much higher than this. Uh, in this case, we have, you know, Saudi in 2035 in the 15 uh, million barrel per day range. I would say that 25 years is a long time, and it's quite possible that, you know, sanctions, uh, again, I'm talking about other countries in Saudi Arabia, but some of the other countries that are held down 
you notice Iran has a lot of resources, but is not shown to have much of a production increase. Uh, South America, OPEC, uh, has a lot of resources, not shown to have production increase. Uh, clearly, uh, sanctions and other financial and institutional constraints that are restricting or restraining the development of abundant resources in some other OPEC countries could be alleviated over this period, leading to some significant supply opportunities from other sources that are identified here. And again, also, although again, we, we project some increase for uh, Iraq out to 2035, you know, in Iraq's view, again, th there's much more potential than, than we're showing there. Uh, you know, recent social and political unrest in the Middle East and North Africa remind us that there's, you know, these political developments really add an extra layer of uncertainty to the outlook for OPEC supply. Uh, you know, future developments that impact either the stability or composition of nat national regimes in a region that's responsible for a major portion of the world oil supply and an even larger share of uh, internationally traded oil supplies are not explicitly considered in the outlook, but it's clear that they add significantly uh, to uncertainty regarding uh, the price and production profiles that we have. So moving to the non-OPEC conventional, uh, you know, we, we see an increase, uh, and again, it's puts and takes. Some of the non-OPEC conventional areas are going down, like OECD Europe and Mexico. But uh, overall, we see an increase of about 5 million barrels per day. Uh, again, it's more than just crude oil. In fact, uh, natural gas, liquids, and refinery gain together account for more than half of the projected non-OPEC conventional supply increase. Uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, EOR, we have a lot of uh, natural gas uh, plant liquids, we have shale oil uh, playing a role, and to some extent I think shale oil is a story that sort of is where shale gas was a few years ago, and um, we don't have much shale oil outside of the North America, and the question is, is that going to be a story like shale gas, where eventually it looks like there's uh, opportunities for shale oil outside of North America as well? That's not uh, built in here. Uh, again, I would note that the, uh, I, I noticed NPC released its study late last week. I've only taken a, a brief look at it. But certainly it suggests that the opportunity for growth in, in U.S. conventional production in a high potential scenario is significantly greater than the projection presented in this outlook. Again, we're not trying to define the, the high end of what's possible, but certainly there are projections of, of U.S. North American production that are much higher than we have. Again, moving finally to the unconventionals, uh, you know, world production uh, increases pretty dramatically. It's really about uh, Oil, oil sands slash tar sands and biofuels. Uh, those are the main uh, unconventional uh, resources. Again, going to the, to the high and low oil price cases, again, I've already described some of, the, some of the change in philosophy here. We looked at both shifts in the demand situation as well as shifts in the supply uh, situation. Uh, really what we're looking at on the demand side is higher than projected growth in developing countries, which I've already indicated, you know, there's a higher sensitivity of oil demand to growth in developing countries than in developed countries. So, you know, in last year's high and low oil price cases, oil use worldwide and in nearly all regions moved in the opposite direction of prices relative to the reference case uh, projections. Here, the relationships between prices and volumes are more varied. So for the OECD, for the developed countries, where there's no difference in projected economic growth across cases, the prior relationship holds. So in the high oil price case, which I think are the, I'm colorblind, but I know, reddish uh, bars, you can see that in the high oil price case, uh, consumption in the OECD is below the reference case levels. Uh, but uh, when we look to the uh, develop, developing world, 
uh, we see that the high oil price cases are actually associated with higher consumption. Indeed, it's the demand push from the developing world that's driving the oil prices up or contributing to the oil prices up. Uh, and again, this leads to a situation in which total supply is actually higher, total demand and total supply are actually higher in the high price case than in the reference case. Again, there are differences across components with a reduction in OPEC conventional supplies offset by the price-induced increase in non-OPEC conventional and unconventional supplies, because the unconventional does respond more to, more to prices. So again, it's a little bit, I think, a more realistic view of, of what drives high and, and potentially low oil price cases, and it isn't just uncertainty on the supply side it's uncertainty on the demand side as well. And in fact, in recent, dec recent decade or so, it's really been the demand surprises, I think, that have played a pretty significant role. So turning to natural gas, again, it's the fastest uh, growing fossil fuel in our projection. Uh, and let's just look at where, where things go. So growth in natural gas consumption occurs in every region, uh, but growth is again particularly strong outside of the OECD, where economic growth rates are again driving demand. Uh, you know, it continues to be very important fuel for the uh, electric power and industrial sectors, uh, in part because of uh, lower carbon intensity uh, compared with coal and oil, which makes it attractive in countries where governments are actually. Uh, trying to do things to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but also because of its significant price discount relative to oil in many world regions, uh, but not all world regions, because gas has a much, right now at least, has a much less sort of uh, uniform price across uh, the different regions of the world than does oil, which is really uh, sort of a one world price type of commodity. Uh, you know. Natural gas is attractive for new power generation also because of low capital costs. You can build it pretty cheaply, you can build it, you can build it pretty quickly, uh, and it's very efficient in its use of primary energy. And indeed, it's the industrial and electric power sectors together that are driving this. They account for 87 percent of the total increase in projected natural gas uh, consumption. And again, this outlook uh, reflects a significant sort of increase in resource uh, availability. So turning from where it's used to where it's produced, uh, the Middle East is the, is the biggest uh, you know, source of increases in gas. Uh, Iran and Qatar uh, together account for nearly one-fifth of the total increment uh, in world gas production, a significant share of that. Uh, comes from a single uh, field, uh, I guess two different names depending on which country you're in, the North Field on the uh, gutter side and South Pars on the Iran side. Uh, China uh, plays a big role in non-OECD uh, Asia's gas uh, production increase, as does India. And then, uh, you know, that's sort of the story. You'll notice the United States has pretty healthy uh, increases in gas. I mean, really, the story of gas is that uh, you have increased production in all uh, regions of the world. Uh, most of India's, you can't see it in this chart, but most of India's gas production uh, is expected, increase is expected in the near term, uh, you know, over the next five, five to ten years, five to seven years. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, point. And, and in the longer term, I think they're going to be looking more at uh, unconventional uh, resources in India. So a lot of attention to gas. Uh, EIA and other U.S. agencies are working to better understand the potential impacts of shale gas on the uh, global natural gas market. Our approach has been uh, to develop an initial assessment of shale gas resources in other countries that may be early producers. Uh, that assessment was issued in April of this year and received considerable attention. So the red areas are the uh, basins that were actually assessed. 
the yellow areas are uh, shale gas basins that were reviewed, but which our contractor was unable to uh, develop estimates due, due to a lack of data. Uh, white colored are the countries for at least uh, one shale gas uh, basin was considered, and gray are the countries for which no shale gas basins were considered uh, in this report. So again, the results, it's not a gl full global assessment, but the results suggest a vast uh, global shale gas resource base. Uh, the assessment uh, of technically recoverable in the basins that were included is roughly 6,000 trillion cubic feet. To put that into perspective, the world technically recoverable resources of natural gas, excluding shale gas, had previously been estimated at about 16,000 trillion cubic feet. Uh, so again, it's a pretty big increase. And uh, really, the recognition of the potential supply of shale gas, and in the case of the United States, the current and rapidly growing contribution of shale gas to actual supply, and it's probably in the 25 to 30 percent range in the first half of uh, 2011, uh, is definitely starting to reshape our view of global uh, natural gas markets, including production, consumption, and trade. You know, here are some of the numbers uh, for the specific basins in various areas that were uh, considered in the initial assessment. And again, while, while the potential is high, uh, there clearly are, you know, a lot of unknowns. It's very early days still. Certainly less early days in the U.S., but very early days for the world. Uh, the actual recoverable resources could vary widely from the mean estimate and indeed, uh, mean estimates themselves are subject to considerable variation across uh, different assessments. Uh, there's a real question about the recovery costs. I mean, all this assessment was was assessment of technically recoverable resources. Uh, recovery costs are what really matters for the economic viability. Our own work with U.S. shale index illustrates this point. So when we looked at sensitivities uh, that varied the amount of production from each well, which is directly reflect sort of the underlying economics of shale gas development, that had a larger impact on projected uh, wellhead prices of U.S. natural gas than other sensitivity cases that varied the size of the resource base. So sometimes people look at the resource base as, you know, the only thing that matters. In fact, it's really the economics of production that may matter more. Uh, finally, there are all kinds of uh, issues surrounding the potential environmental impacts of drilling, uh, and that may uh, deter the development of uh, shale gas in some areas, even if the resource is available and the economics are favorable. And, you know, different countries have gone different ways on this. So you have France, who's taken legislative action to ban fracturing, South Africa, moratorium on fracturing. On the other hand, uh, you know, Canada is moving forward with production, uh, Poland is moving forward quite aggressively, and China is very interested. So it's a mixed bag, and it's still early days. But we certainly have uh, production of unconventional gas, including tight gas, shale gas, and coal bed methane, growing rapidly over the projection period. Uh, and we see that it plays a major role, already plays a major role in the United States. Uh, and plays a large role in China, in Canada, and the United States. The, the green portion uh, would be the total uh, unconventional projection. So electricity markets and carbon, and then we're done. That's the road map. I, I don't, I don't want to lead you guys through the desert here. Uh, you can see an end. So on electricity, uh, it's the fastest growing form of energy use in the, in the reference case. It has been for the past several decades. Uh, you know, the growth rates, again, are much faster outside of the, uh, o outside of the OECD than in the OECD. Uh, and that's really pretty important because in an area where load is growing rapidly, oh, move my slide. Got it. Oh, I'm in too fast. You know, in, in an area where load is growing rapidly, you have a lot of what I would call new versus new competition. So if, as, as the demand for electricity is growing very rapidly, you got to build something new. Uh, in an area where load is growing very slowly, uh, 
most of, a lot of the, comp I mean, there's some load growth, so there's some, we got to build something, what should it be? But a lot of the competition involves potential new sources competing against existing generation whose capital cost is already sunk. And that can be a much different proposition. So when someone, you know, oftentimes you hear these comparisons of, you know, we're going to compare the costs of different generating technologies, and implicitly it really matters if you're talking about what I call new versus new, which is critical in areas where load is growing rapidly, or what I've called new versus old, in which case, you know, it's a much tougher proposition to displace some of the uh, older technologies. So with that, uh, you know, as an introduction, here's the uh, sort of the electricity picture. Uh, you know, big growth, uh, coal at the top uh, provides the largest share of world electricity generation, although its share does decrease uh, modestly from its 2008 share, where it's about 40 percent of the world, to about 37 percent in 2035. Uh, liquids, uh, you know, really, really falls off. Part of that has to do with the, uh, you know, the, the high prices of liquids, and there's certainly a strong incentive to substitute toward other generation wherever possible. Uh, you know, it's 5 percent of electricity primary uh, fuel in 2008, drops to just over 2 percent in 2035. Uh, in this regard, the rest of the world is really catching up in some respects to developments in the U.S. and other OECD countries. In the U.S. now, oil-fired electricity, probably well under 1 percent. Uh, you know, natural gas and renewable uh, account for increasing shares of total generation. Again, I've mentioned that renewable is the world's fastest growing uh, resource. That's particularly true if you look at non-hydro renewables. Uh, which are growing extremely fast. Uh, now, in this projection, uh, nuclear's share of generation increases slightly between 2008 and 2035. Uh, you know, but again, the question is, how does that change in the wake of some of the recent uh, Fukushima and the policy responses to it? I think there's really a significant distinction in the nuclear power scenarios between the OECD countries which account for 80 percent of today's nuclear generation and the non-OECD regions. Within the OECD, although some new nuclear capacity is added, the projection for nuclear power generation to 2035 depends primarily on decisions that are made regarding the utilization of existing plants and the possible extension of their licenses. In contrast, outside the OECD, the growth in nuclear production depends to a much greater extent on the addition of new plants. So the question is sort of what's going to happen in terms of uh, nuclear power's role in the global energy mix. And again, the full extent of, you know, the withdrawal of government support for nuclear power is uncertain, but we've already seen some reactions, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, uh, Japan, and China, uh, early retirements or even a decision not to pursue extended uh, life of existing plants in the OECD countries could have major impact on the projections for nuclear power, even if significant building of new capacity outside the OECD were to proceed. So again, the, the full policy responses have yet to be seen, but the initial responses suggest projections for nuclear power from both existing and new plants are going to be reduced. And I will point out that in the domestic context, uh, EIA in its annual energy outlook will explore uh, issues related to uh, nuclear plant retirements and possible licensing extensions as they apply in the U.S. context. But this is a pretty important question. Uh, coal, uh, you know, coal is another example of an energy activity where the global picture is dominated by a small number of players, notably China, uh, other non-OECD, Asia, and, uh, and the U.S. Uh, you know, looking back uh, 20 years and forward, 25 years, coal-fired generation in other parts of the world, which are, I guess, the tan bars in the graph, are, are pretty flat, around uh, 2 trillion uh, kilowatt hours. Uh, but again, coal is pretty important uh, in the U.S., in China, and in other non-OECD Asia. 
and we can see that uh, in this case we have singled out China itself because it's such, by 2035, it's such a huge part of world coal-fired uh, generation. So the end of this is uh, energy-related carbon dioxide emissions. And again, without specific policies to limit greenhouse gas emissions, uh, energy-related carbon dioxide grows by about uh, 43 percent over the projection. Uh, China's energy-related carbon dioxide emissions, uh, which were 16 percent higher than those of the United States in 2008, uh, are more than twice as high uh, than U.S. emissions by 2035. So, and again, non-OECD Asia, the rest of non-OECD Asia is growing uh, as well. I would say that coal continues to account for the largest share of uh, global carbon uh, dioxide energy-related emissions. Uh, you know, natural gas use grows a lot, but its share of global emissions doesn't grow uh, that rapidly. Certainly the uh, projected growth in emissions applies an accelerating rate of increases in atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide. I guess they're now somewhat in the 391 or 392 parts per million and growing at an annual average rate of uh, slightly below two parts per million over the last six years. Uh, however, our work doesn't really uh, go forward beyond that to address the relationship between rising atmospheric concentrations of CO2 and other greenhouse gases and changes in average temperature and other measures of climate change. Hard enough for us to do the energy side. We'll leave that uh, to, the, to the climate uh, scientists and the atmospheric modelers. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sit? Yeah. I'll well, thank you very much, Howard, as usual. That was... Scintillating. No, no, not the word you had in mind. It wasn't, actually. You know. <laughs> it was extremely robust and, and very useful. Um, I got to say, though, you know, I started off the day on an upbeat note, and you've kind of put a nerdy energy downer on it for me. Um, it, it's, it, it is, uh, it's hard to watch something like uh, what we just saw and see how energy trends increasingly over the next couple decades become more and more about what happens outside of the U.S. and understand that we will probably be putting fewer and fewer resources towards those trends that illuminate uh, or towards those publications that illuminate some of the trends that we're trying to understand better. So. Uh, I will get off my soapbox after that, and uh, I think Frank's going to pass a cup around for donations. But um, uh, we've got plenty of time for Which questions. Which we can't accept. Which you can't accept, right? Well, we'll have to figure out something else to do. All right. <laughs> um, we've got plenty of time for questions, but I also wanted to mention before I forget that um, uh, EIA has been kind enough to let us post uh, a webcast of this presentation. Uh, we're also being live webcast. Uh, and uh, a copy of uh, Howard's slides on our website, as well as the information being available on the EIA website uh, with all of the other sort of resources that they've got there as well. So we encourage you to visit more to sort of delve into uh, uh, the, uh, each of the trends that Howard had talked about this morning. Um, before we get started with your questions, I just want to remind you of the ground rules here, especially because we're being webcast and we want all our viewers to be able to hear your very thoughtful questions. Um, please wait for a microphone. Please uh, state your name and affiliation. And if you could please put your uh, question in the form of a question, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, I will give you a second to think of a couple. And I just wanted to touch on one thing that, you know, Howard, you did talk about a little bit. But uh, because we're a public education institution, uh, if you could unpack a little bit, folks, uh, that I will be asking you the difference between shale oil, oil shale, oh, excuse me, yeah, and tight oil and how EIA treats it. Because we did see the NPC study come out last week, as you talked about. Uh, it is sort of being thought of as the new unconventional gas, potentially. And so it would just help people right. to understand how you all treat that as a topic. Well, uh, terms like conventional, unconventional, would, you know, tend to, okay. I guess, change over time. But sh shale, oil shale is, is this, uh, for us, is this uh, product there's a really a product, a uh, carriage that's, you know, under, underground, uh, a lot in Colorado and Utah. 
it's not really crude oil, it's something that would need to be processed into oil. Whereas shale oil, which I think is what the uh, NPC is calling tight, or a lot of what the NPC is calling tight oil, is uh, really crude oil that's located in uh, shale formations where it, the oil does not flow readily to the wellhead and some of the same treatments that are used to produce shale gas uh, are used to produce shale oil to get the oil to flow to the wellhead. But once it flows to the well, it is, uh, the, the composition of it is, is similar to other types of, of crude oil. So again, uh, I believe the NPC, because there's, there is sometimes confusion, and, and we have used the terms shale oil for the conventional oil in shale formations, and oil shale, which is this other stuff, I believe the NPC has decided to go for the term tight oil, mm -hmm. and, and I think they are including uh, the shale oil that's being produced in the Bakken and parts of the Eagle Ford, uh, you know, as tight oil. Great. So think of tight oil as really very close to sh what we call shale oil and oil shale as something else. And we, by the way, there is a, there is a This Week in Petroleum article that, that lays this out pretty nicely for people who are interested. You can search the analysis text of the past This Week in Petroleum uh, because this is a question that has come up before. Yes. I was trying to save your frequently yeah. asked questions, people, a, a minute or two. So, okay. Start with questions. You've got one over here. Robert Charetta, President of International Investor. Uh, a quick methodology question and then a, a broader one. Uh, when you talked about nuclear, were you accounting for the retirement of plants as well when you're projecting to 2035? Uh, we do take account of, of, of sort of no re retirements, but it's, it's also fair to say that the economics of existing nuclear plants are, are fairly uh, attractive. And I know that in the U.S. context, you know, we have seen a lot of life extension. And prior to Fukushima, we thought we saw a lot of interest in life extension. There were some countries that had uh, previously planned early retirement, you know, earlier retirements that, that were extending their, their horizons a bit. Now, in the wake of Fukushima, that may have changed to a significant extent, and that was not reflected uh, you know, in the outlook. So retirements are an issue, but keep in mind that once you've built a nuclear plant, it goes to this new versus new and new versus old thing. You know, the, the, econo the economic case for an existing nuclear plant tends to be pretty compelling. Uh, the economic case for a new nuclear plant, somewhat less compelling. So we had uh, some retirements, but uh, a lot of life extension in our uh, IEO scenario. If you'll permit me one more real quick. Oh, sure. Uh, we often talk about uh, conventional versus non-conventional, OPEC versus non-OPEC. Can you comment on th what you see in terms of trends between state-owned and state-controlled versus uh, private sector in the oil and petroleum industry in particular? Uh, have you seen uh, and do you try to monitor that which is controlled by states versus that which is in the private sector? Well, we, we all know that a lot of the uh, sort of the, the proved reserves, so to speak, are really dominated by the state state owned slash state controlled uh, sector. Uh, that's less of a factor, you know, in the unconventionals, which are, in our outlook, a growing part of the total liquid supply. But again, it's still a pretty small part of the total liquid supply, and we do have production from the the OPEC. Uh, you know, region sort of uh, being very important still, and that's clearly state controlled. Some of the areas that we've shown picked out for growth uh, in the non OPEC include Russia, include uh, Brazil, and there's clearly state participation uh, there as well. On the other hand, we have some conventional growth in the United States that has less uh, state participation. So I think all in all, uh, it's no surprise, uh, you know, the state, the state players are very big and remain extremely big uh, throughout this projection, although there are some parts uh, of growing supply, notably the unconventionals and the, uh, and the U.S. conventionals, that, 
you know, don't have the major state participation. But I would say it's not like the hold of the state players is being broken uh, in this projection. Okay. Mark. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks, Howard. Let me add my comments to Sarah's on the love fest of uh, EIA and the <laughs> value, uh, the public value of the uh, service you provide. Uh, I'm Mark Finley with BP. Um, what, what's the assessment that underpins your analysis of the transport sector in terms of the rapid or potential for penetration of electrics, hybrids, even natural gas in transportation? Thank you. We don't have a, a super high, I, I mean, we definitely have some penetration of some uh, alternative uh, technologies into transportation. But again, under, under current laws and policies and without technological breakthroughs, uh, you know, we do not see m sort of a massive change, uh, shift away from uh, certainly petroleum for uh, light duty vehicles and freight trucks. So our outlook for uh, petroleum does not have uh, large amounts of, uh, let's say, electric drive coming in. Now, in part, that reflects the current laws and policies uh, situation. Uh, for instance, in the U.S., there are very big incentives for uh, purchase tax credits and, and the like for purchases of electric drive vehicles, but they, but they expire at some point in time, and we don't presume that they would uh, be extended. Now, one thing we do have, though, that holds, holds down, I think, the growth in petroleum consumption. I mean, if we had uh, a China, you know, going along the same path as South Korea, uh, with respect to uh, adoption of, of personal vehicles, and indeed all, a lot of those personal vehicles, or the vast majority of them, were all petroleum driven, we'd have higher uh, growth in petroleum demand in China than we have. So I think one of the places, you know, where, where we need to look very carefully in addition to the, to the sort of choice of primary fuel uh, for different parts of the vehicle fleet is, is how personal transportation is going to develop uh, in a market like China. And we certainly have, you know, we have more mass transit, more trains. Essentially, they're, they're still making some decisions about what infrastructure they're going to provide for personal transportation. And we do not have them following uh, the same type of curve as, uh, let's say a South Korea in terms of development and uh, personal transportation. So that sort of maybe counteracts the fact that we don't have a lot of, you know, a very significant non-petroleum light duty vehicles uh, because we probably don't have light duty vehicles as a whole growing as fast as some other projections that have China and India following the traditional path uh, would have. Interesting. Right there. I'm Bob McNally, president of the Rapidan Group. Uh, ditto, ditto on the love. Congratulations to you and your staff. All right, ask product. a tough question. Come on. All right. Uh, I'm going to. Um, a tough one and an easy one, if I could. Uh, the tough one is uh, taking your point that China's income growth will swamp the improving energy intensity. Why do you see China's energy intensity improving so much? Is it something just having to do with China? Is it a broader trend? And in general, as you think about your, your expectations for energy intensity going forward, would you say the risks to that forecast are skewed one way or the other? Are we likely to be disappointed with a less intensive or more intensive versus your forecast? Secondly, recognizing we're about to pass the cup in an austerity, nevertheless, Howard, if you would please prioritize, if you could wave your wand and improve uh, one or two information sets, data sets in the global energy market, uh, what would your wish list be in terms of data that, if, if it was public and available, would best improve our understanding of global energy market fundamentals? Thank you. Okay. Uh, in terms of your first question, I think you're you're likely to be disappointed because any any point for any sort of a, you know projection of a particular number for a particular year is is going to be wrong. Uh, I, I can honestly say that uh, other than something like the nuclear, where we have certainly reasons uh, since the time this was developed to, let's say, to think it moves in a certain direction, I can't say we know which, which direction, have a view. One thing I would point out is there sometimes tends to be a relationship between improvements in energy intensity 
and the rate of economic growth. Sometimes when the, when the economy is turning over faster, there's, there's more replacement of less efficient equipment with more efficient equipment and the like. And so in some sense, high growth itself can be a driver of improvement in energy intensity. Uh, in terms of information we want, I, you know, one of, the, one of the problems we have a lot is, is looking at, uh, you know, as some of the non, I don't know, some of the developing countries become more important in, in tightly globally integrated markets like world oil markets, it is really important, I think, to get better information about, uh, you know, what is going on. I mean, we, we put together measures of, of apparent consumption, apparent consumption growth, but a lot depends on whether uh, stocks are being accumulated or whether the stuff's actually being consumed. And uh, frankly, for some countries, we just don't have very good uh, information about that, and, and that leads to mistakes. So I think uh, understanding uh, you know, better information on oil inventories globally would be pretty important because that's such a tightly integrated global market. Uh, you know, in, in the domestic context, uh, I, th I think we probably need better and more timely information as we put our balances together on product exports. I think we've sort of been behind the game uh, on that. And there's been, uh, you know, one of the things that's happened is the United States has become, uh, I mean, we've always been a, a big importer of crude. We're still a big importer of crude. Uh, we've always been a big importer of products, but now we're turning into a big exporter of products. And it's really important for us to, to get a, a more timely handle as we put together the, the weekly uh, balances on what's going on with exports. So I think those are two things I would single out. They're both related to the oil market. It's not because other markets are unimportant. It's because the oil market is the one that's, that's globally most you know, tightly integrated. Yeah. Okay. Go back there, and then we'll come here. I'm, I'm Brian Wingfield with Bloomberg News. Um, just curious whether, excuse me one second. Just curious whether the projections for natural gas include the U.S. Geological Survey estimates in August. I think they. I, I, I can't hear you. He's curious as to whether or not your projections include for, for unconventional gas the USGS projections from August. The USGS numbers were significantly lower than the, than the Energy Department's numbers. Um, Are you so talking about Marcellus or? Mar yes, I'm sorry, Marcellus. Ah, uh, going, going domestic, huh? <laughs> All right, well, we do. I think we want to, uh, you know, incorporate some of the uh, USGS information. We will be updating, uh, you know, our estimates. Uh, it's really our standard practice to incorporate information from the latest USGS assessments. You know, we, we've done that traditionally. Again, we were in the position where we had an outstanding USGS assessment of, I think, two trillion cubic feet. Uh, for the Marcellus, which we didn't find to be something we could use. It was clearly out of date, and they've increased that by a factor of 40 uh, in their assessment, uh, but it's significantly lower than the assessment we had been using. Uh, we will be updating. It's one thing to point out that, that they focus, though, on undiscovered uh, resources, and that's only a part of the total. Uh, the total includes uh, both proved reserves and inferred reserves. And uh, one of the things we need to do is uh, get the information from uh, USGS that allows us to uh, sort of figure out what areas they excluded from their uh, assessment. And, uh, and we have obviously, we are responsible for the collection of proved reserves information, so we have that information as well. So ultimately, the, I think we will end up with a number uh, in our forthcoming AEO that uh, incorporates information from uh, USGS, but uh, I think you can expect that it won't be uh, exactly the top line number. Uh, the devil is really in the details. Uh, as I mentioned in the uh, talk, I also want to point out that, you know, while certainly technically recoverable resources are important, uh, you know, the, re the recovery economics really matters a lot. To our projections, and if you look at, because uh, we had a big section in the uh, 2011 annual energy outlook that looked at shale gas uncertainties, 
And we actually looked at two things. We looked at resource uncertainties and recovery cost uncertainties. And the recovery cost uncertainties actually had a sort of a larger impact on our projections than the uh, resource base uh, uncertainties. So the answer is, uh, you know, the answer is always it's complicated, but the, the answer is yes, we are going to incorporate information from USGS, but I don't think there should be an assumption that that uh, technically recoverable resource information, uh, we know directionally what type of effect it would have on our projections, but the assumption somehow that everything hinges on that, uh, I think may, may be incorrect. And again, I don't know that you're making that assumption, but you asked the question, so I thought I'd provide the information. <laughs> if I could just build off on the unconventional uh, gas work that you expect to do question. The, uh, for those of you who haven't you know, spent any time looking at it, the study that EIA did in conjunction with ARI on unconventional resource basins that Howard talked about is actually quite interesting. Um, we had a session here on it not too long ago. Would you have any plans on building off on that work, either in terms of the geographic scope or a sort of going beyond sort of just the technical recoverable aspects? Well, it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, again, well, we have to, I mean, the, you know, EIA is a program. I mean, we, we have to operate within our, our resources. Uh, you know, we have some, uh, obviously there's a lot of interest in the, in the international outlook. I think it's really, critical with respect to gas, but at the same time, there's a lot of interest in, say, end-use uh, uh, consumption data, how, how we use energy in buildings in the United States. We've heard a lot from people about that, which is a program that, that we had to take a survey out of the field. Uh, there have been some folks in the petroleum industry who, or not the petroleum industry, analysts and, and industry and, and academics who've been concerned about the termination of some data series. So there's certainly an area we would consider, but you know we have to be realistic. I, I mean, I think w what it's a mistake to do is to uh, resources are not sort of silly putty. So I don't know. I'm dating myself, but I played with this stuff as a kid, and you just spread it thinner and thinner. Uh, I, I think that's probably not the responsible way to go. I think we have to pick and choose, and. Uh, and, and we will pick and choose, but it's not, if we decide not to do something, it's not because we think it's not important. It's because, uh, you know, quality is an important dimension as well as scope, and we, we have to worry about that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Do you have a question? Um, Can you wait for a microphone, please? Thank you. Uh, Tom O'Donnell, um, graduate of international affairs at uh, the New School in New York. Um, I, my question was about, uh, given uh, the amount of new gas that's coming on, and probably a lot more over time, is just thinking about what, what you put into thinking about ways that it might cause some fairly dramatic change in, in the mix of what's, what's used. Uh, my one, one of the three things I want to ask you, it was actually already asked by Mark Finley, and it's well taken, that the difficulties of natural gas making inroads in transportation here because of infrastructure and technology problems. I understand that. The other two things I'd like to ask about are, there's geostrategic concerns. For example, two of the brown spots you showed on the map were in Poland and Western India. And um, uh, places like that, there's a, quite an impetus to uh, use any kind of natural gas, especially in Eastern Europe. Uh, there's, so that's a geopolitical one. The other one is, uh, with all the takedown of nuclear plants, nuclear capacity in Europe that's supposedly going to take place, even if they just replace it with natural gas, the carbon load is going to go up, and with their given their commitments, it would seem they're going to have to take down nu uh, take down coal plants and replace them with gas to come anywhere, stay anywhere near their carbon targets. So, if you could comment on those aspects. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I, th I think the the global gas situation is just just extremely interesting, and I think one of the questions is ultimately, are you going to, you know, right now you have this sort of global gas pricing where, you know, Japan, you know, some parts of uh, Asia have significant linkage to, to oil. I, I think right now, you know, LNG in Japan is like $14 a million BTU, and you have, you know, uh, the, the national balancing point in the United Kingdom at about $9 a million BTU, and, and probably the average price in Europe somewhere between the two. And then you have the U.S. at $4, and the question is, you know, are you going to get some uh, 
you know, coalescence of, of, of prices, and I think that's an, are you going to get gas on gas competition globally? And I think that's, an, that's a, the overarching question. But with respect to your specific questions, yeah, I, I had mentioned that, you know, Poland clearly, uh, they, they seem to, uh, just a lot depends on, pro, on, on how you prioritize different things, and they seem to be moving, uh, I guess, gung, ver, very, very aggressively, potentially, on their shale gas. Uh, you know, India, I think, uh, you know, c could move aggressively uh, as well, although we didn't single them out, you know, as, as a country. Some other places moving less aggressively. And again, the production economics are really going to be important to that. And that's, that's really a, a very open question. In terms of Europe and its commitments, and certainly, uh, you know, taking down a lot of existing nuclear do does not help on greenhouse gas emissions. One doesn't have to be a deep analyst to, 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 to see that. And, and ultimately what they're going to, you know, there's, I, I, guess a, I guess there's an expression, something got to give. And the question is, what? And I'm not sure I know the answer to that. But to the extent that, uh, you know, a lot of existing nuclear is, is, is taken, retired in a pretty aggressive way, uh, that certainly has implications for uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I, I don't know what they're going to do. Someone here? Hi, Luvian Myers, Golden Global Strategies. Um, I am just curious as to whether or not your um, supply projections take into account the sort of cost of doing business in non OECD countries. So, you know, transportation costs, infra infrastructure development, um, human capacity constraints, et cetera. Supply, pro supply projections for what in particular? N uh, natural gas, but oil as well. You know, I, I mean, some of the areas that we, you know, identify for, uh, 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 I guess we sometimes use cryptic language, but we, we talk about sort of, uh, constraints on resource access in, uh, in certain non-OPEC areas. So certainly, uh, if, I mean, do a thought experiment. If, if, if the U.S. had, let's say, Russia's resource endowment, you know, would our production be higher? Or would, would the production level be higher than what we're projecting here? I, I guess my thought is, Probably, so that might be, you know. So we understand we, we, we build in in some sense uh, the notion that there isn't fr just because you're outside of OPEC doesn't mean you have sort of, I guess, you know, 100% free market access to all uh, resources. But it is the case again that some of these areas, you know, despite whatever challenges they face, you know, have been uh, areas where production has uh, has been increasing in the. Uh, other parts of the former Soviet Union, for instance, uh, you know, production has been strong despite some of the, I guess what you would describe politely as the cost of doing business. And, and, and uh, you know, and, and we, you know, so, so we're trying to be realistic about that, but it isn't like we, we assume that, that Western capitalism settles over the entire, uh, you know, non-OPEC world, you know, instantly. Uh, you know, we do try to reflect some of those constraints. Now, with respect to the unconventionals, we really see that as a lot uh, much more market market driven. Uh, certainly, the the biofuels are, are pretty market driven uh, and and policy driven. Uh, market driven in some places, policy driven in other. The certainly the the oil slash tar sands. Uh, you know, we see is huh oil sands. <laughs> yeah, this is the EIA though. We see. So if it's NRDC, it's tar sands. If it's, if it's you giving the talk, it's oil sands. If it's me giving the talk, well, whatever. The, the Canadian sands, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that we see is, is very market driven. So some places, yes, some places, no. I guess that's the. Okay. You, Kevin, and then right there. Thanks, Kevin Massey from Brookings. A uh, question about the uh, Middle East as a source of uh, or a s uh, center of demand for, for oil. Um, you mentioned that your projections have, I think as a base case, 15 million barrels a day coming from Saudi Arabia in 2035. But can you talk about the impact of uh, increased oil demand in the region and what that will mean for global uh, markets and, and supply demand balances? 
Uh, we definitely have a significant increase growing demand in uh, in the Middle East. I mean, both because of the, the economic growth is good and the population growth is good and uh, and the fact that there's a lot of sub subsidization, which is which is bad, but, but I guess is good for uh, oil demand growth. So yeah, I mean, there's no question that you want to take, you know, I mean, we do do a global balance and, and the Middle East is a, is a big area for uh, increased uh, demand. I mean, it's also the case, and I don't know how this, how this exactly will get sorted out, but there's certainly a lot of, the Middle East is one of the areas that uses a lot of oil uh, in applications uh, like electricity generation and, and desal desalinization where, uh, you know, it might be very attractive to use uh, other fuels in its place. I would have to go back, I don't have all the details in my head, but uh, I think at least part of the, let's say the shift in uh, electric generation fuels uh, away from oil from like 5% of the, the global total to 2%. Undoubtedly, the Middle East would still be one of the places that uses more oil than other places. The question is, do they start using other other things? I mean, they have, they have good renewable resources, they certainly have natural gas resources, and to the extent that you would, let's say, free up, uh, you know, it's interesting, I mean, you look at alternative natural gas developments in the Middle East, and, and you're thinking, you know, worrying about whether we should pursue sort of a, a $2 a million BTU cost option or a $4 a million BTU, I won't mention which country might be looking at these things, cost option, and I'm thinking like, Gee, you know, one translates into $12 a barrel of oil equivalent, the other into $25 a barrel of oil equivalent, and every day we're waiting, we're burning $100 barrels of oil. So, you know, the question is really what, what's going to happen with respect to that. But there's no question that Middle East is a, is a growing consumer of, of oil in our projection, as well as a growing producer. Okay, right there, and then we'll do Al. Uh, Mike Costi, I just uh, retired from the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, you mentioned uh, South Pars and Northfield. Um, how do, do you judge uh, uh, Turkmeni reserves uh, in comparison? And uh, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you feel that uh, any of this Turkmeni gas will eventually make it to India, or will it be split between China and Russia for the most, for the most part? Boy, I am, I am, I am not the, one thing we don't do in the, in the, in the IEO is look at the, at the particular flows. So it's a very good question. Clearly a lot of Turkmeni gas is now going to China, right? Is, you know, but the, but the question is what happens in the future? The answer is, uh, the International Energy Outlook certainly wouldn't look at that. In fact, we don't even look at, while we have Canadian sands production, uh, rising dramatically, you know, for, from our perspective, it, it's not, we're not saying where, it, where it's flowing. We're, we're looking more at the, at the global balances. So I'm sorry, I can't, I don't really have the information to answer your question. Good question, yeah. though. <laughs> Al Hegberg with CSIS. Thanks very much. It was a terrific presentation. Could we go back to gas for a minute? And not as a policy question, but looking at the U.S. gas resource base now, or the reserve base, in terms of whether that changes the global market beyond diverting LNG cargoes away from the U.S. or uh, other kinds of things. At, the, at some point, do you see uh, production of U.S. gas being exported? Well, that's certainly a, a question that's, uh, you know, come up uh, a lot, uh, you know, given uh, some of the uh, work obviously, you're aware that uh, the Department of Energy, not not EIA, but the uh, fossil group in the Department of Energy, has really uh, recently approved one uh, project license, and uh, you know it's two more pending uh, for export to non-free trade agreement countries of LNG. Uh, you know it's certainly not built into our reference case uh, projection uh, at the present time. You know, we have seen already a lot of sort of re-export of, of some of the LNG that we've imported, but that's really a, a, we have also the one plant that I guess is soon to be shut down in Kenai that uh, exports to uh, Alaska. That's a relatively small thing. But I think the question you're asking about is, is you know, are we going to see significant uh, exports from, we'll say, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, where those three license applications are? 
The answer is we, do, we don't have it in our, in our reference case. I, I think part of it relates to this big question that I kind of twisted an earlier question about as to whether the global gas market is going to turn into sort of gas on gas, uh, you know, competitive uh, environment. Uh, I guess some of this could potentially tie into the uh, opening of the, of the larger Panama Canal, which might make uh, you know, transportation, certainly Asia seems right now to be the, the premium market for uh, LNG. Uh, I guess there's a question of, you know, will it continue to be a premium market because you have these, these differentials and at some point are you going to get the competition or not? So that's one key big question there. I guess the other big question there is how does the U.S. compare with other places where there's a lot of natural gas because, you know, $4 a million BTU, $5 a million, you know, we have our prices in North America rising uh, in our projection and while 4 or $5 million dollars a million BTU is, is cheap relative to 14 or 9, you know, it's expensive relative to other places perhaps where you could uh, secure feedstock for LNG. So I'm kind of dancing around it a little bit, you know, I feel like Tevya, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, you know, I'm, 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 not, I'm not that, you know, I, I know what the factors are, which is, which is ha how the U.S., you know, gas competes against other gas. On the other hand, the U.S. has an advantage that some of these facilities are sort of uh, the non-liquefaction part of these facilities is already a sunk cost, uh, you know, of these folks who've come in for licenses. So that could be an offset to a somewhat higher cost of the gas. We don't have it in our reference case. That's what I would say. I would certainly not uh, rule it out. Okay. I think we've got time for one more question. So right there. Ron Minsk, <clears throat> with Securing America's Future Energy, given the importance of spare capacity in the oil market, production capacity, and its relationship to the price of oil, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about the trends on spare capacity and the factors that may affect it. Yeah, I, I, I think we're probably going to be living in a world of tighter spare capacity than we've experienced you know, let's say over, I mean, I'll, I'll pick 1986, because I'm, I'm old, but also that's, you, you know, it's the case, uh, I mean, you know, at, at that point in time, both the combination of, of efforts to reduce, reduce demand, the, the first set of fuel economy standards, the, the activity to take oil out of uh, many sectors other than transportation, uh, you know, the effects, of, the effects of high prices, I mean, you know, we all know that uh, Saudi production dipped way down relative to its prior peak and, and we had they had huge amounts of capacity and uh, ultimately the world from 86 through the early 2000s you know had a lot of spare capacity I, I don't think that uh, initially uh, that, that all of that spare capacity was was intentionally built up but we were in that situation un until fairly recently I think now we're out of that situation uh, spare capacity is much tighter, and uh, I think very few producers have an incentive to uh, intentionally build spare capacity. So we're going to be operating in a world, I think, where the type of spare capacity margin that we had seen, let's say, from 1986 to the early 2000s, you know, we're unlikely to see again. At the same time, uh, you know, we have what I mentioned as the sort of the, the demand shocks tied to income growth in developing countries, potentially much more, much more of a factor than they have been historically. So again, like in 2004, when things really began to go very tough uh, in, in oil markets, uh, a lot of that had to do with sort of un unexpected or unanticipated demand increases. So it's really the the prospect, I think, of unanticipated demand increases still out there, yet the spare capacity margin that we're working with, I think, is, you know, likely to be significantly smaller than we had uh, been gotten comfortable with, uh, you know, from 1986 for, for almost 20 years after that. So I think it's a different world. I think there'll be a lot of volatility uh, potentially in, uh, in oil. Uh, 
markets. I mean, the markets have to balance, and in the short run, demand and supply are pretty inelastic. And, and I think that's the lesson we've learned. It's not a happy lesson. <laughs> Well, listen, Howard, we probably can't, we can't offer you money, of course, but we can certainly offer you our thanks, and the thanks to your staff, many of whom are here today, for all the right. time and attention you spend on putting this together. And thank you for spending your morning with us. Thank you. Thank you.